what was the first novel? It's a question that has caused academic debate, online discourse of varying levels of civility, and has been racking my brain for long enough that I decided to do some research on the subject. And the results were, shall we say, interesting, and has brought me to an interesting conclusion. It's difficult to impossible to find the beginning of anything we can call the novel. Why? Well, join me as we find out in this very special episode of Author Talks, where the heck did the novel first begin? I am Thomas Wrightson, and this is your New Year's dose of maybe, hopefully not, insanity. To start off, we need to think about what a novel even is, and how to define it. I have my own ideas about what a novel should and shouldn't be, and I need to try not to let them cloud my judgement when it comes to this subject. Because everyone has their own ideas about novels. For some people, epic poems act as novels, even though, in my opinion, they're just, well, they're epic poems, they're poetry. It's not quite the same thing. To begin with, a novel was apparently first defined in the 17th century as a work of prose fiction, longer than a, than a novella. Of course, it's also been used to refer to shorter works that we would now call fairy tales, short stories, novellas. There are also several derived terms, and the word novel comes from basically the Latin novellus, new, fresh, young, modern, as a diminutive of novus, new. So, yeah, a novel is anything new, technically. It's a new piece of fiction. To give you just one opinion on what a novel is, here's a quote from Ernest Hemingway's 1964 semi-autobiographical book, A Movable Feast. Since I had started to break down all my writing and get rid of all facility and try to make instead of describe, writing had been wonderful to do, but it was very difficult, and I did not know how I would ever write anything as long as a novel. It often took me a full morning of work to write a paragraph. So says the man who apparently wrote his debut, A Movable Feast, in six weeks. But then, Ernest Hemingway is Ernest Hemingway. More than a bit messy, let's be honest. The main thing that this quote implies, introduces, is the concept that a novel is long. That wasn't technically always the case. As I have previously stated, the term was applied to prose fiction of any length. A short story could be called a novel, even though today calling a short story a novel seems like a complete misunderstanding of what the term even is. So. Let us begin by laying the foundations of what a novel is today and see if we can find examples of that going back as far as we sensibly can. The novel today tends to be defined by marketing, publishers, agents, all those relatively irrelevant things. I say that as a published author myself, help. As a book that is somewhere between 60, 70, that can vary, and 100,000 words plus long. It's a continuous story. It can be first person present, first person past tense. It can be third person close, first person overhead. It can be, if you're bold, or Vikram Seth, 
second person, which is a whole narrative voice thing. Actually, there's a whole narrative voice dimension to this that is separate from the concept of the novel that maybe I'll get into some other time, but is well worth a, an academic discourse in and of itself. The main thing that a novel is, is something that you can hold in your hand that is bulky. But this particular definition is relatively new. It's changed as the market changes. Stories have become longer as our ability to retain information, the ability to transfer information, the wish to record it in this very traditional book-oriented way has come into being over the past four to five hundred years. Dependent on how long it's still up, because she's planning a bit of a channel purge, Jinzi, aka Proper Bird, is hosting at the moment a video on her YouTube channel that goes into long stories. It focuses a lot on video games and television series like Stranger Things and Dark, but it also covers in brief elements of stories, which can include books, which became quite long. And of course within these novels are the concept of novel series, which tell a prolonged story. Lord of the Rings, Narnia, Wheel of Time, etc. Or, if you want to go outside the fantasy and science fiction genre, things like Barbara Taylor Bradford's A Woman of Substance, which is the family saga. We'll get back to that later. So let's see if we can step back, take a few paces into the past and see where the novel became something that could be printed and sold profitably. Not something that was a niche interest for a limited number of people who had the means and the education to both commission and read books. The novel as we know it today came about through a chain of different circumstances. There was increased literacy among a large breadth of the population, men and women. There was a slow increase in leisure time, allowing for reading to be something people could do around their work day and their chores. There was easy distribution and production of printed books and printed magazines, pamphlets, leaflets, with the improvements to printing technology. And, above all else, the printing itself got cheap enough that the books could be sold for a profit. They weren't special commissions. They were things that could be brought forth to the public. They were still expensive for a long time. There were several companies in the 20th century that really launched themselves into the stratosphere through the production of cheap, easy to print, easy to distribute, very affordable for readers of all stripes versions of the classics. Penguin Classics is the obvious example, but there were other companies that did that before Penguin. But novels were less often the kind of thing that you just had as the first thing you sold. More common was the serialised story that later got reprinted as a novel. The Count of Monte Cristo, the works of Dickens. These are just a few of... Oh yes, of course, the work of Conan Doyle, definitely. Certainly with Hand of the Baskervilles, which is a full-length novel, but started as a newspaper serial, or rather a serial in the Strand. These started out in short form, little installments. And when you read them as novels, it kind of stands out because they're very episodic, especially several bits of Dickens' long form stuff. But there's also the contradiction, you could say, that, well, there were novels that were long, continuous stories before that. Yes, but some of them could also have started, and some of them, in fact, did start as serials, things that were well, I don't want to say churned out, but were produced to a schedule for a paper, a set of pamphlets, and then collected into book form, or were first released in an abridged form, and only later, for whatever reason, published in their long-form version. Most of H.P. Lovecraft's longer stories, for instance, were first published in Weird Tales in abridged format, something that he was not happy about, and then only later, many of them after his death, released in their original, long-form, generally unedited versions. And the world was blessed with Lovecraftian opinions. Thankfully, we do have the ability to ignore his opinions, but that's tea for another time. 
A book often considered to be the first modern novel is Miguel de Cervantes's Don Quixote. Published between 1605 and 1615 in two parts, it, well, you don't need much introduction to Don Quixote. It is the incredibly bonkers, satirical story of Alonso Quijano, who becomes to believe that he is a knight and decides to go on knightly adventures with his labourer turned squire, Sancho Panza. It's ridiculous and funny and sad, and many people know the first half because of the infamous windmill incident, but there was also a second part which almost deconstructs the first part and is a more sombre reflection on um, the main character. Don Quixote is very well known. It's almost too well known. And in my opinion, it's actually pretty reductive to say that it's the first modern novel. Because not only is that discounting a number of other books that could have well have informed Don Quixote or did inform Don Quixote, or other works that were happening at the time, but it was also a completely ignoring other parts of the world. Because, lest we forget, Spain is in Europe, and Europe for a long time had a rather dismissive attitude towards literature from other parts of the world that wasn't translated into its own individual lingua franca, whether that was Frankish, Spanish, French, nowadays it's English. It's just, you know, one of those horrible Eurocentric attitudes that dismiss a ton of other stuff. So Don Quixote may be the novel that everybody turns to when they think of the first novel in, in capitals, in quotes, but I don't think it deserves that distinction. It may be the text that codified a lot of what modern novels do, but that's different from it being the first. It's just the one that got a lot of them right. Now, I was going to go off on a bit of a tangent at this point, talking about things that I realise don't have much of a place in discussions of where the novel originated, because it was mostly to do with genre. And genre and fiction are kind of independent of each other. Genre is a way to classify stuff that's relatively recent invention for the sake of bookshelves and bookstores, not so much important to the evolution of what we recognise as the novel. So, passing on to before Don Quixote and outside of Europe, well, outside the main bulk of Europe anyway. Let's talk Icelandic sagas. The Icelandic sagas could be seen as the predecessor to a ton of other types of literature that we have in modern novels today. It has family sagas, historical sagas, fantastical sagas. Of course, there is a bit of a wobbly definition when it comes to sagas, because they might not be considered the kind of literature that we would compare to novels in our current sort of exploration of different things. It's more to do with the kind of stories that they codified and told in long-form prose, which getting to the classification of novels is something that I personally think a novel would typically have, the kind of long-form prose storytelling. So we have things like the Valsanga Saga, which is basically a prolonged narrative of the decline and fall of the Volsung clan. And then there's the Saga of Grettir, which is a saga of a particular warrior, Grettir the Strong, and his rise and fall and the tribulations surrounding his family both before and after his death. Then we have Lakstala Saga, which is another family-oriented one, but also takes in a broader scope of Icelandic history and adds a good dash of fantasy with the influence of a cursed sword on two brothers when they get into a fight over the love of the same woman. And you may be pinpointing a few things that they that the sagas have in common with the modern novel. The singular protagonist as a la Grettir, the brothers quarrel and the love triangle a la 
Laxdala, the grand family drava of the of the Volsanga. Then there's things like Njol Saga, which is just a prolonged description of events and different periods of conflict between families during Iceland's early period. It's the kind of story that would see extensive trimming today, but back then was a way to codify events and also a tradition from a group of people and a civilization that had storytelling as a core part of who they were. Icelandic sagas were written in one form or another technically between the 1200s and the 1800s, though that latter date is up for debate. Most of the ones we know about are from between the 12 and 1400s, during a period when Iceland was really forming as its own community, its own nation. But that's still being pretty Eurocentric. So how about we take a step away from Europe? Take a step towards the exotic East, the realms of China and Japan. Anyone who knows about Chinese literature will know about the four great Chinese novels. They are the centre of the Chinese literary canon. Sometimes that goes off with a bang. But even saying that is having to put an asterisk next to that statement because it depends which four you're talking about. The earliest of these great Chinese novels is Romance of the Three Kingdoms, written during the 14th century and a tribute to Luo Guanzhong. And basically it tells the story of the Three Kingdoms period, a time between the end of the Han Dynasty and the beginning of, I think, the Ming Dynasty? I don't know for sure, but following the end, true end of the Han Dynasty when China was split between three competing powers who warred for decades, or even actually, yeah, was decades, almost pretty much practically a century to bring the country back together. For fans of modern movies, you will know a chunk of this narrative from the movie Red Cliff, which dramatises the Battle of Red Cliff, which is set within this Three Kingdoms period. And also there's Koe Tecmo's whole thing, which is the whole premise of the series is it's the Three Kingdoms period. One of the two you're bound to have heard about is The Water Margin, or Water Margin, or Outlaws of the Mask, which is so it's generally attributed to Shi Nayan, and it's about 108 stars of destiny who are released from imprisonment and are reincarnated in China and go up against a corrupt system uh, set within the Song Dynasty. It's a hundred chapters. It is actually complete, which is a rarity for a lot of novels from this period. And it's great. It's actually a really good story in and of itself. And this was written again somewhere in the 14th century, sort of before the 15, early 1520s. The other two big novels, or certainly one of them, come from later, the 16th century. And one of them is, of course, Journey to the West, needs barely any introduction. Attributed, to, written by Wu Chengen, it's, yeah. If you know the Monkey King, Sun Wukong, then you know something about Journey to the West. If you've read Dragon Ball or know about that character, Goku, you've experienced a version of Journey to the West. Then. Jinping Mei, or translated the, roughly into the plume of the golden vase or the golden lotus, is described as a novel of manners, basically. And again, it's written during the Ming Dynasty in the 16th century. 16th century, good lord, yes, the Ming Dynasty extends from 1368 to 1644. That is a long dynasty. And it was considered, for a time, one of the four canonical great Chinese novels, except it was a bit too explicit in its portrayal of sexuality. 
for a lot of people so it was kind of shunted out of the classification for a long time. Replacing Jinping Mei it was Kao Shui Qin's The Dream of the Red Chamber or The Story of the Stone. Basically a family drama and it, based on Kao's own life and it's kind of feels like a it feels like a weird outlier in some ways but then it it was written in the mid 18th century and its first full printed edition was released in 1791 these novels these chinese novels are long they are very long by western standards especially both the water margin and journey to the west have a hundred chapters a piece and they can get quite verbose in their translated versions. Um, if you, uh, there are plenty. There are quite a few different translations of them, and none of some of them are drier than others. Uh, but it's amazing to see how the Chinese tradition has gone on to influence many aspects of the modern novel. I mean, I can only assume that a uh, one of the new big names on the block, Zidane Zhejiao, her, that their own writing wasn't only influenced by Chinese history, which they go into in their channels, but also by the great Chinese novels, which have quite a bit of stuff to engage a modern reader, more than you might expect. China had a bit of a head start on this because printing and wider distribution of books, even if it was still to a somewhat exclusive audience, occurred pretty early in its history, certainly compared to Europe, where the printing press didn't come along until the 1400s and wasn't widespread until the 1600s. In China, it seems to have occurred more common, that kind of easier printing and distribution of writ the written text happened sometime in the 10 to 12 hundreds, which is very early. And also it had a tradition of narrative and verbal driven storytelling in its folklore mythology, or it seems to have done. Of course, it's not immune to some problems. As I have said, it is, depending on the translation, very dry. But then some English novels that are acclaimed are also very dry. I wonder if that's one of the classifications of a novel. It has to have, at some point in its history, been considered dry. I mean, the Icelandic sagas are also like considered that. <clears throat> Moving on. Moving on to Japan, we have the Big daddy -o, the one that a lot of people will tout as the earliest novel. Again, not counting the earlier preconceptions around Europe. Uh, let's just move on. <laughs> This is The Tale of Genji, written by Murasaki Shikibu in the 11th century AD, which is quite some time ago. It's the story of Hikaru Genji, who is the son of a fictional emperor, his fall from grace after being just removed from the line of succession for political reasons, and his eventual climb back up and the ups and downs of his love life, which are just yeah it's it's quite modern it's been called by some japan's first novel but that is somewhat debated mostly because there are other titles before the tale of genji which could be considered novels the tale of genji more properly falls into a japanese traditional story storytelling called the monogatari and actually its japanese title is genji monogatari Monogatari is basically the Japanese story, tale, legend. Like Hyaki Monogatari Kadankai is the tale of the hundred demons, or roughly that, which is a Japanese ghost story tradition that also falls into the tradition of the Monogatari. And there's also Takitori Monogatari, which is the tale of the bamboo cutter and could be reckoned to be the earliest extant version of this style of storytelling. There's something to be said for the tale of Genji being the first true long-form novel that 
could be considered a novel by modern standards, but it is still a bit of a stretch. Also, it's probably not entirely capable of being properly studied because the original Japanese it was written in was Hai Heian Court Hiragana, which is very difficult to read for modern Japanese audiences, let alone um, English people. And it wasn't until Genji was translated by the poet Akiko Yosano that it became quite widely read in the modern Japanese um, population and became this great thing. And even before this, there are stuff that could be considered novels and are called, in retrospect, novels. There are works dating from the 1st century BC to the 2nd century AD that are called novels. If you've ever read The Golden Ass, that is technically considered a very early novel. There's a so-called Byzantine romance, which, well, it's just what it is. It's sort of described as a kind of revival of Greek and Roman liter literary tradition following the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. And then there are the Indian, ep the Indian great epic stories like the Kadambari or Kadambari, I think it's Kadambari, where just where you cannot easily sum it up in a single sentence. They are long and they're not like the epic poems like the Mahabharata. They are prose works of fiction. They are novels or rather they're called novels now. Here is where we get into the slippery slope of terminology, because as previously noted, novel was once used to describe works of prose fiction that could also be counted as short stories or smaller things like that. And quite often people didn't use the term novels to describe these stories, these long form narratives. Novelists themselves didn't use that term very often. They were called romances. The term romance is now often attributed solely to stories of romantic love, but it used to just mean a romanticized story, a romantic setting, that kind of otherness that was essentially what a lot of novels still strive for today. Something slightly idyllic, unless you're deliberately doing something outside of that. So where does this leave us with the novel? You could theoretically, obviously, construct a long and intricate thread, a plot thread even, of how the novel came to be as we know it today. But having seen all of these things that are now called novels, and that's without going into things like the Epic of Window or the other African epics that were purely oral tradition before they were codified and written down in the 20th century by anthropologists. There are stories that very likely were told by the Native Americans or were recorded in South American codexes that have been just lost to history that would have made amazing novels. The novel is a very modern construct in terms of the history of people telling stories. It's almost a modern classification for a story that's too long for a comfortable sit down journey on a train, say, but not long enough that it has to be split into multiple manuscripts. There's something to be said for the term novel as a descriptor. And as I said, you can trace a history of how the novel evolved, appeared, matured. But the simple truth is, I don't think that's a very good way of looking at it. And that's the conclusion I came to, the conclusion I sort of partially vaguely laid out at the beginning of this slightly rambling look through a very small selection of bits and pieces of things from around the world that are called novels. You can will and should find loads more just by digging around a bit. The novel is not a fixed thing. It has never been fixed. 
And as we go into this new year and more novels are released, including my own, oh my goodness, then I hope you'll remember that what was once a novel wasn't necessarily the same thing as people thought when they wrote about scientific romance, when they did epistolary narratives, when they created the tale of Genji, when they wrote The Golden Ass. Were these novels? Today, perhaps, but not back then. To give you just one opinion of what a novel is, here's a quote from Ernest, Ernest, uh, bleh. Depending on how, on how, on how, on uh, how, The popular novel of today came about through a number of circumstances. First and principally, the readership, the ability and education of people, so that, hold on, that, that's bad phrasing, hold on. The novel really came into its own due to a number of factors. For one, printing was becoming very easy. It was the era of around the time when the novel first appeared. Oh, good grief. But novels weren't the starting point for these kinds of stories. If you look at all, pretty practically all of the stories that are now often collected into book form, they started either as short stories or as newspaper serials. The works of Sherlock, the works of, well, Sherlock Holmes, uh, I'm gonna have to start this again. A book many consider to be the first modern novel, in quotes, and definitely in quotes because there is still a bit of debate about it, obviously, is Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote. Don Quixote was originally sort of a more self, -con a, a novel that was in and of itself, oh god, I'm gonna have to do this again. This is not so much uh, <clears throat> the Icelandic sagas can be seen as the predecessor for multiple branches of fiction because they themselves covered multiple genres. As I said, I'm not going to discuss the genres, but they have influenced so much because they cover so much. There is historical sagas that relate to families or events in Icelandic history. There are more fantastic. Um, there are more fantastic. Uh, oh God! Okay, I'm going to redo this bit. If you want to go, mm. the Icelandic sagas were written technically between the 12th and 18th. Oh God! Hold on. The Icelandic sagas were written technically between the 11th and 19th centuries. 11th, 9th, hold on, 10th, 2, 1, 3rd, 2, 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 3